Welcome to Smart Branding, a podcast dedicated to branding, naming, and domain names. I'm Tatiana Bonneau, and with my guests, we try to help you create and grow strong, memorable, and meaningful brands online. I believe time is one of our most precious assets, and so I want to thank you in advance if you decide to spend the next 30 minutes with us. I promise to do my best to make those worth it. Let's go. So today our guest is Jeffrey Klein. He's a TEDx speaker, lecturer at a number of univers- lecturer, sorry, at a number of universities. Uh, he's also a visual content producer, passionate about helping people communicate more effectively through the power of stories and visual communication. His career of over 25 years is in the field of helping connect the right message to the right audience for the greatest impact. Hi, and welcome to our show. And thank you for making the time, Jeffrey. Wonderful having you with us. Tatiana, thank you very much for having having me. Great to be here. So let's start with a classical question. Give me a bit of a background about yourself, what you do, how did you get into storytelling? Uh, yeah, let's start with that. Well, I like to think my career has had a somewhat nonlinear path. Um, I, I believe in the kind of saying from John Lennon, which is life is what happens while you're busy making other plans. Mm-hmm. So um, I grew up kind of Sitting at the at the dinner table, often with my father and my grandfather at opposite ends, swapping stories, and so I think I always, from a young age, felt that that was it captivated my interest, and in not just them sharing kind of like the nuts and bolts of what they did, but actually telling these stories. And I think from a young age, I liked writing, and I liked writing stories, and so that kind of evolved. Um, I went to university and studied. So I was a sociology and English major, uh, but it was because I was really interested in at the liberal arts college I went to, that's how you did creative writing and and film studies. Um, Mm. And despite having a slight detour and going to law school, I then (laughs) moved to California. Um, My father and grandfather are judges, so there's some kind of legacy there. Um, But I really wanted to work in the movie business. And so, because I was fascinated with movies and and the stories. And so I moved to California uh, after my second year of law school finished my credits, but started working in the film industry. I worked at a talent and literary agency. My first job was in the story department, uh, where I actually read a lot of bad screenplay. Um, <laughs> it was kind of, I, I saw a lot of what a bad story was. And it was, um, it, it, you recognize, you know, telling a good story is not as easy as everyone thinks it is. Um, mm. But I went on from there and then worked uh, for the president of production at Paramount Pictures and MGM. And I saw how movies got made in the process from when they bought a script. And then I always found it really ironic that the first thing the studio does when they buy a a screenplay is they hire another writer to rewrite. (laughs) Um, And so, you know, they they, they sometimes are bidding wars for these scripts. If you're a new writer, there's someone else coming along. So, you know, you might get one rewrite and then, and they, and then also it's like, they bought your script. They love it. They, you know, they pay for it. And they're like, okay, here are all of our notes and things we want you to change. <laughs> so it's kind of the process that I always found kind of curious is like, well, I thought you liked that. And when I realized that telling a good story and being a good writer is all about rewriting. So writing something might be pretty easy to do. Writing something good is much harder and requires putting in an extra time. So I was, I was, but I was, you know, working on these movies, seeing them all get made. I was a, a little peon in the big machine, but I was in the big machine and it was really cool to see all these movies get made and see the process. And, and some of them were good and some of them were bad. Uh, I was very fortunate. The people I worked for were really passionate about telling a good story. Like they wanted to make something that people wanted to see. Um, and I think Hollywood sometimes has a reputation of just turning out junk and they do for certain reasons, but, I was fortunate that some of the films that were made while I was there, I thought were really compelling. You know, uh, the first movie mm-hmm. I, I was exposed to was The Truman Show, which I think was so inventive. And, uh, smaller movies like Wonder Boys. And then, you know, yeah, we had some big blockbusters, Mission Impossible and things like that. But the reality is about telling that story. And when I left the film industry, because I fell in love with a girl uh, who's now been my wife of 20 years, uh, and she's awesome. British. So we moved to Manchester, England, where I started a real estate company for a variety of reasons and was missing out on the creative um, juice that I had from the film industry. And so after a number of years, I got very frustrated and I decided that I had to get back to working with some creative people. And so I worked at a design agency in Manchester and I was like, oh my God, marketing, this is my way back. Um, <laughs> and it's great because it kind of marries my right and left brain. Um 
and I get to now as a producer, I produce video and, and animation for, for a bunch of corporate clients across a lot of different industries, which I love. And it's all about what's the story that they want to tell that's going to mm-hmm. actually get people interested in what they're selling um, and wanting to do it in a way that's going to be compelling. And so that's kind mm-hmm. of, I've come sort of full circle um, <laughs> and it's, it's, I love it. I, and I really passionately believe all of this is about, you know, human connection and communication. And I think mm-hmm. we're all trying to connect to one another in a meaningful way. That's kind of what we're here for. And the best way to communicate is by telling a story. So that's mm. kind of, you know, my viewpoint on it and what I speak about and what I do in my day job. And it's become my world. Mm. I love that. It's a very, it's a very cool story. Like, story, like you said, from a full circle. It's, um, it's very interesting. I find that we, in a way, like literally when you start talking to, to kids, you know, you start by telling them stories. And it's such an intrinsic part of, of us as, as humans telling stories. And, and then when it comes to, to business, you have so many entrepreneurs that feel like, oh, that's not for me. Like, I, like I'm, I'm not in a creative industry or I'm not big enough or, you know, that sort of thing. So what's your, what's your take on that? Who can or should be looking at improving or, or even having storytelling as part of, of their overall marketing strategy? From my, from my perspective, everyone. So because in the end, any business, what are they trying to do? They're trying to connect with customers and get them interested in what they're selling. So it's about effective communication. So it is interesting to me because I think, again, storytelling has been around since the dawn of man and cave drawings mm. and around the campfire. You know, it's in our DNA. We're hardwired mm. to tell stories. And we're really good at when we're younger. And when we're adults, we're pretty good doing it in social settings. You know, we still mm. do it when you're at the cocktail parties and you're sharing stories. But when we actually then get into business and we get into marketing, we kind of shift and it's like, oh, wait, now we need to kind of tell. We need to tell about how great our products are and all the features and the benefits and how mm. great this award we won and, you know, and how long we've been in business. And to me, that's a missed opportunity and it's not a, a good strategy for mm. success because the most successful companies you'll find have really honored and leaned into storytelling. You know, when you think of a good ad or you think of a good communication, even internally, you know, communicating things because facts alone are not effective ways to impact behavior. Mm. And so if you were trying to get someone to do something, which ideally, I think that's what marketing is trying to get someone to fill out that form, to call, to click, whatever it may be, you know, your messaging is trying to get someone to take action. Mm. And giving facts isn't how it does. There's a kind of a corny way of saying, which is, you know, that people use, but I think it's very uh, correct, which is facts tell, stories sell. Um, mm-hmm. And and that's, that's the idea is that any business, startups, you know, mid-sized businesses, global conglomerates all need to understand that if they're not communicating effectively, then they're not going to connect with their audience. And if they want to do it, they need to learn to tell the story that matters to the people they're trying to reach. So mm-hmm. it's not just tell a story because sometimes they tell a story and it doesn't matter to the people uh, where they're telling mm-hmm. the story without understanding their audience. I uh, teach in one of the kind of um, concepts I came up with what I call the 11th commandment, know thy audience, because mm-hmm. it, if you don't know your audience, then you've lost because you'll be mm-hmm. telling the story or communicating in a way. And if you don't understand what's important to the people you're telling it to, they're not going to pay attention. Mm-hmm. And sadly, we need to put, you know, attention is the real resource that we need to tap into. We need to capture mm-hmm. people's attention and then we need to keep their attention. And story is really good at doing that. Uh, and so when you mm-hmm. tell a story, our brains, you know, what I loved about the idea behind story and, and business was that I think from a kind of emotional level, I was like, yeah, story, it makes sense to me. But now I've learned this science behind the story you know i talk about the science of story and there's actually research that supports why a story is so powerful so i'll mm-hmm. share a little about kind of of that so the story is that there was a neuroscientist at princeton university Uri hassan who was really interested in how our brains worked depending on what the input was mm-hmm. so he hooked up two groups of people to monitor their brain activity one group were given facts, features, benefits, you know, bullet points. I, I jokingly call it death by PowerPoint is often the way that it happens. <laughs> people are given yeah. you know, these chock full of, um, and then there was a group that was told that information through a story mm. and the group 
that were told just facts, two parts of their brain activated, the, the vernix area and the Broca's area. Super important parts of your brain because they're the parts of your brain that you need to decode meaning so you understand what someone's saying. Interestingly, the group that were told a story, yes, their Broca and vernix area activated, but so did all the other parts of their brain basically light mm. up. And it's the parts of their brain that they would use if they themselves were experiencing the story. So mm. I always look at it as like your vic- your brain is vicariously living out the story you're being told. And he talks about a concept called neural coupling. So I think it's fascinating, which is when I tell a story, the audience and I's brain activity mirrors one another. Mm. So I always use a simple example. If I tell you a story, Tatiana, about me kicking a ball, your motor cortex activates. <laughs> if I tell you a story about the sweet smell of fresh baked cookies, your olfactory cortex activates. Mm. So I have the power using what we know about story to enable your brain to behave the way I want it to behave or to evoke the kinds of emotional things we need to hook people in to buy. I mean, mm. decision-making is an emotional decision that is then rationalized by our rational brain. Mm. And so it's one thing that I always want to make clear to people is, you know, when you talk about, you know, facts tell, story sell, they're like, okay, so I don't need to worry about the facts. I don't need to worry about the data. I'm a big mm. data fan. But data alone is not going to convince someone to take the action. It's the mm. way you package it. So I sometimes look at stories as the vessel for carrying those facts and figures to get mm-hmm. to the destination, which is to get your customer to buy. Um, and so for me, it's it's really the most powerful and effective way to connect with someone on mm. the story. That's, yeah, that's a very good uh, metaphor you used there with the vessel. I think that makes it very clear, and which is actually in a way, an example of, you know, how you get something better when there's a little visual image attached to it that kind of simplifies it, it connects better. Yeah, and in terms of, you know, so I, my worldview is very simple. We're all trying to connect with one another, and the best way to do that is by having effective communication. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, what's the best way to communicate is by telling a story. And then it's, well, what's the best way to tell a story? Visual communication. Mm-hmm. So that's, you know, my whole world kind of summed up in, in, in one sentence because we process this, you know, we process visuals 60,000 times faster than text. So again, mm-hmm. you may have information, but if you want to, you know, we, we were a, you know, sound bite culture, we have short attention spans and having a visual for your story is a shortcut because it's, mm-hmm. it's going to be what gets people. And we don't have much time, you know, there's so much information. I, I joke that one of the challenges to connecting with people is there's, I joke, there's two pandemics affecting us. Not the one that we've been dealing with. Two other pandemics, short attention spans and infobesity. Short attention mm-hmm. spans, and there's debate about the, the, the veracity of the information, but our attention spans are getting shorter. The one story that a lot of people reference, it's, you know, to, in 2000, they did a study where the attention span of a human was 12 seconds. The attention span of a goldfish is nine seconds. Mm-hmm. And currently our attention span is eight seconds. So our atten- <laughs> the human attention span is shorter than that of a goldfish. Pretty scary. Uh, I yeah. told this to my I, my students last night and they were freaking out. Like, what? <laughs> Again, whether it's whether that's inaccurate, it, it is true that we need to capture people's attention. You know, people will focus on what grabs their attention. The second problem we have is infobesity, a term I love that I wish I had invented, but unfortunately it, it was. Um, and it's another term for information overload. We are being, data and information is being processed and created at an alarming rate and we can't keep up. There's no way. I think someone said, when you go on to social media at any given time, there's 300,000 pieces of potential posts, information you could see. Mm. Well, there's no way to process that. That's the idea. There's more information than we have the capacity to process. With those two things being the case, short attention spans and infobesity, how do you possibly get your message to mm. cut through that noise? And the answer from my perspective is tell a story because mm. a story actually will enable people to pay attention. And then more importantly, they'll remember, understand and remember what you're talking about. One the mm. study that uh, Professor Hassan, the results of the study were that there's about a 20 to 40% increase in understanding of the message and retention. Mm-hmm. So if you're a marketer or you're a business trying to get people to buy your product or service, pretty good if they remember, 
you know, like you don't want to say, Hey, I spent all this money on advertising and they don't even remember what it was. Mm. So it's an important piece to make sure and a story can help connect as a shorten the distance to connect with people. Mm. I think, yeah. And on that overload of information, it's very telling that you can see in the past few years, a lot of companies or like people who are consultants or like they, they're basically the face of their brand um, have like the, they going back to some very basic stuff where you don't have touched up polished videos or text that like obviously have been written and edited a gazillion times, it's like literally people, you know, filming themselves with their phone or talking about some daily stuff. And there's that authenticity that, has been lacking, I guess, and you're a lot more likely to stop and look at something that has that more authentic spirit than all of those, you know, polished, uh, touched up videos that all look the same. Yeah. So there's two things that, that reminds me of one, when people ask me, well, how do you tell a compelling story? And one of the things we talk about is authenticity, because mm-hmm. I like to say the BS radar is higher than ever. Uh, Mm. partly because of the way we communicate with each other across social media and and we just the capacity to be found out if you're not being genuine is high Mm. and i would say it's not only a good idea for business it's just a good idea to be genuine oh my god in business (laughs) you know i have integrity Uh, but it also it also will help the bottom line and so it has if those people are like oh i want to try and trick people it's very Mm. short you know short-term focus that will usually blow up in your face um and and i think if you're looking for a long-term strategy telling stories that are being authentic in general is super important transparency has become something that it's no longer like well maybe i will you have to be um because Mm. if you're not the damage it would do um there were studies done that if someone has a bad brand one bad brand experience with a company it takes 12 good experiences to make up for it so you mm. can't afford to have someone think you're being disingenuous. It would just mm. hurt, you know, your business too. Um, in yes. terms of being, and I think again, being authentic and, and the way you tell stories. Um, yeah, there's there's a I produce video and animation, and so I think there's a time and a place to have that more professional version. But with mm. the the advent of smartphones, you know, that have really the cameras just get better and better, and the quality gets better mm. and better. But it's about even even with bad quality video if it's genuine the message will come through and so there was i was at one point telling clients go take some bad video as long as you, they can hear what you're saying you know none of it matters <laughs> now i think the the level of sophistication we're expecting now because of the advent of technology we still want it to look good and sound good and um mm. but i think one of the things you talked about was if you use the same template type communication you know you use a service because there are a lot of animation tools out there but what ends up happening is they all look the same. And so what I always tell people is if you're going to, you know, create a piece of content, you want it to be original and distinct, you know, mm-hmm. and so there are lots of tools to help you do that. I mean, but it's, you have to make sure that your message is genuine and that it is done in a way that differentiates you from other people. You know, no one wants mm-hmm. to hear the same old, same old. What is it that makes it different? Because from my perspective, a brand is the reason why someone picks your company over what's behind door number two. Mm, um, and by being different, and one of the ways you do that is by telling a story that only you can tell. You know, by having mm. a brand that all, you know, your origin story as an example, where you, the problem that you solve for your customers in the way that you do it is hopefully fairly unique to you, or there are elements of it that are unique to you, and you need to showcase that in order to really penetrate and show people, yeah, why I should go to you versus somebody else. Absolutely. Let's talk about some common mistakes that you see entrepreneurs make in in your experience and and just generally around. We just sort of touched on one, which is not being genuine, not being authentic. What what else would you say is something that people often get? So the biggest one that I generally see, and if you look, go to people's websites, um, it's not custom the focus is on themselves as opposed to the audience Mm. um the hero of their stories is them not the customer Mm. and so i think we you need to stop and think about what's in it for me i always joke the most popular radio station wii fm what's in it for me because i I say this a lot to the people nobody cares about what you do 
People go, what do you mean nobody cares? I'm like, nobody cares about what you can do. People mm. only care about what you can do for them. Mm. You know, so to say, oh, I've been in business and I've won all this, my ninth year in a row mm. winning this award. And, uh, and there's a speaker, a uh, friend of mine, James Rubalata, and I, he, he recently spoke and told about a distinction I think is super powerful, which is the distinction between credibility and relatability. Mm. I think a lot of companies are focusing on, we need to be credible, we need to be credible. But if you don't find a way to be relatable, mm. then it doesn't matter how credible you are. Yes, yeah. there's a threshold. You, you know, they don't want to, they need to know that you know how to do the job or, or offer the service that they're looking to hire you for. Mm. But that's like, that's threshold basics. Mm. Then you need to focus on, okay, how do we relate to the people? What is it that they care about? What is it that they want solved? And so when we're talking about how to tell stories, we say, start there. Start with the problem mm. of your customer and then talk about how you solve it and then talk about the impact. So it's, it's really about one of the big mistakes is that people are still kind of an ego thing and they think mm. they need to say, how, how great am I? Come and work with me. I am the greatest blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And people are like, it should be about <laughs> so <lots of> <laughs> when, you, when you, when you hire us, we help you. Here's how we mm. help. Here's what we do for you. Here's the problems we solve. And so it's really about being mm. focused on them and telling stories. That's why case studies and testimonial stories are really powerful because you're not talking about yourself. Either someone's talking mm. about their experience with your company or you're sharing an experience with a case study about we had a client come to us who had this problem. Mm. Because if you do that, then any other business that has that same problem will go, wait, I have that problem. I always mm. joke about uh, personal injury attorneys who get a bad rap. But one of the things they do really well <laughs> in their marketing is they're very direct and very problem-centric. Mm. If you look, I go on the subways or on the bus, you see, have you been injured in an accident? Mm. Don't say anything about what they do. It's focusing mm -hmm. on your problem. And it does something really important. If you haven't been injured in an accident, you won't waste your attention and time and you'll go away. And so they don't need to worry about you. Yeah. If you have been injured in an accident or someone you know, you're gonna, it's going to grab your attention. You're like, oh my God, yeah, and I have medical bills and blah, blah, blah. And so starting there, you really capture that attention. And then you're enabled to then get the time to share with them how you can help them. So mm -hmm. to me, it's about understanding your... That's why back to the 11th commandment, know thy audience. The more you know <laughs> about someone... And what's important to them, the easier it will be to reach them with content stories that are going to matter to them. Absolutely. And that's very funny that you bring that up that, you know, people in when it comes to storytelling um, make that mistake that they, they tell the story for themselves, that the, the, the right. century. And like before I got into naming and domains, I, I was working in IT. So I had a web development and software company. And funny, it's not funny because, you know, companies suffer for it, but I had the same problem with the IT company and I still have it now with the, the naming and domains. And you just mentioned that people forget that what they do as a business is for their clients. So like when I had the websites and IT and software, I had so many times like entrepreneurs that would, they, they would come and say, solve that problem or do that for me. And then they'll be sitting there going, I like that. And I like that. Do this like this, do this like that. And it's like, yeah, but it's for your clients. Like it's not about what you like. <laughs> and I have the same thing now with uh, with the domain names. People are like, yeah, but I'm fine with that domain name. I don't, you know, I can remember it. It's like, yeah, but your clients. <laughs> and it's exactly the same what you just said. Like people would, you know, I mean, if you do an audit of, I don't know how many websites, it's, it's still like crazy how many are exactly what you said, just centered around me, 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 me. Yeah, if you go to a, a, a website homepage and it says, we are great. You know, we're the best. Mm. I'm bouncing away, you know, you know, where it's like, you know, you deserve fill in the blank. All of a sudden mm. you're speaking to me. Oh, wait, I do? Great. Thanks. You know, mm. it, it's, it's kind of simple human behavior that a lot of us seem to ignore. Mm. And I think it's, again, we've been trained in business that it's about, you know, competition. You've got to prove mm. yourself. Um, Oh, there's a great quote. It's, you know, people don't care about what you know until they know you care. Something like mm. that. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's the motto you should put up in, you know, your, your boardroom, you know, mm. people don't care about what you know until they know that you care. So how can you show people that you care? Well, speak to them and what they're mm. interested in and what they care about and what, 
What's keeping them up at night? Mm. That's where so we have to start. So how, how do you help with that? Tell me a bit more about that, the process and, and what services exactly do you offer and how does it look like from the moment somebody reaches out to, you know, how you get on to, to, to a final solution? for them. So we, I, I operate in two, two areas. So I have a content marketing company and then I'm a professional speaker. So from the kind of content perspective, I, I reverse engineer just the way we talked about it. So when I meet with a client, I say to them, okay, who are your clients? You know, what does your customer look like? What do you know about your customer? And start, and what do they care about? So I'm asking them to answer the same questions that I talk about, which is if you don't know who your customer is, then how are you going to speak to them? And you know, if you don't mm-hmm. understand what their pains are, how are you going to speak to them? And then what we do in terms of, so I keep things simple. I think complication is unfortunately something people think, oh, the fancier it is, the more complicated it is, the better it is. And I think it's the opposite. Um, mm-hmm. So when we create, we basically will, you know, usually people come to us who are looking for content. They're looking, they're going to do some advertising, they're redoing their website, and then we'll have a video or an animation to share their value. And so we do what a lot of people refer to as explainer videos. So it's to explain what it is that how we can help you. And so when I meet with a client, a lot of times we do the discovery is about, okay, what is your, what are your goals? Well, my goal is to get the register to ring a bit more. You know, that's always every every business wants more, more leads, more conversions, more money. And that's, and there's nothing wrong with that. But the best way to do that is by figuring out how you can help your customers. So I, I um, often use what I call, I, I created something called the story pad. And it's a formula for any business to tell their story, particularly for advertising, but, but it, it can work in any kind of messaging. And so Aristotle back in 350 BC was credited with coming up with the three act structure, which is in most movies, and most books, and it's, you have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Mm. So I took this concept because I think that's important to keep it simple. And so what, People go, okay, yes, I'm, I'm into story. I want to tell stories. Okay. Yeah. Three act structure. Great. I, I remember that's important. Beginning, middle, and end. And then they go, what do I say in the beginning? What do I say in the middle? What do I say? You know, how do I craft that? And I said, don't worry. We have something in the story pad. Makes it really easy. So the story pad, the P A D represent the beginning, the middle, and the end of your story. So you just have to fill in the blanks, literally. So the P, we've been talking about this. What's the P in the beginning of your telling a compelling story? What's the problem of your customer? Mm. What's the pain of your customer? That's where you start. And I'll give you an example in a second. And then the A is the answer. You have a problem. Here's the answer. The answer is your service or your product that can help solve that problem. And that's where a lot of companies stop. You've got a problem. We've got an answer. But I really think that the D is super important. The P, the problem, A, the answer, and D is the difference it makes to them or their business. That's the impact. And people often talk in, in the story world about needing to have, take people on a, a, what, a transformational journey without showing them what life will be like afterwards. You've missed out on an amazing opportunity. So you say, okay, you have a problem. We have the solution. We have the answer. And here's what's going to happen. Here's the impact to you. When you do it. Mm. So let's take, um, I just want got, got pretzels. Okay. So uh, let's say, so what's the, I'm a pretzel company. I make soft pretzels. How do we, how do we tell our story? So the first thing is like, well, who are your customers and what do they want? What's their problem? The problem is they want a tasty snack. They're hungry. That's their problem. And they're not sure where to get, you know, what, what's good. They want a, a tasty snack. That's going to fill them up. I'm making some. So don't worry, Tatiana, I know you're hungry. But I have these really amazing pretzels that are going to fill you up. They taste amazing. They're healthy-ish. Um, and, you know, and maybe health is, you know, your problem isn't healthy snack. You're, you're like tasty snack. So again, you have to clarify what the problem is. I want something, I want a healthy, you know, I want a tasty, salty snack. Don't worry, we got the perfect thing. And by the way, if you want it sweet, we can dip in chocolate. No, I'm just, so you, your problem is you're looking for a, a salty snack. And you're not sure where to get a good one. We have really quality products in our pretzels. And there you go. Then it's about, wait, wait, the difference. And when you have this, you're going to have, you're going to feel satisfied. You're going to be happy. You're going to feel great. So that's, you're going to go from being hungry and cranky to satisfied and happy. And so there's a very silly, simple example for a business that's selling pretzels 
how they would tell their story. And so if we were going to create an animated video, and we've done this for ice cream brands, and we've done this for, you know, uh, other food brands, it's really simple, you know, have you been looking for, you know, a tasty, salty treat, you know, and you're sick of, you know, stale popcorn and, and you know, flavorless potato chips, don't worry, you know, Tatiana's pretzels are amazing. And, you know, they're just the right amount of, you know, softness with just a touch of salt. And when you have them, your body will thank you, your heart will thank you, and you'll skip along into the sunset. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so that's basically what we do. So what, when we start a project, whether it's a video or an animated product, it's about what's the story we're going to tell. It's about the script. And what's interesting is both video and animation are visual deliverables. We deliver a video, we deliver mm-hmm. an animation, but it all starts with words. And so when I tell mm-hmm. people that I do visual storytelling, I don't mean that words don't matter. Words are super important because it's how you articulate and then bring it to life. Without the, the script, you don't have a story to tell. Um, and so the process for us, we have a very streamlined process in how we do things. We basically start with understanding what is you're trying to accomplish, who is your audience, what matters to them, and therefore what's the story we want to share with them. And then we, okay, let's write a script. And our script will have two columns. It has a column of the actual, usually voiceover for animation, and then mm. visual. <clears throat> what, what, what are we going to see on screen? And so we don't do anything until that script's approved. And then we go on to storyboard and voiceover. And then once those are approved, then we actually create the animation. And along the way, as we make revisions until we get that magic word, I always say to my clients, I need the magic word approved because sometimes I'll send them something. And I'll, you know, if this is approved, let me know by replying approve. And sometimes I'll get the response, looks great. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, please, what does that mean? Is this approved so I can move on? And so I have to train clients uh-huh. sometimes. Most of, most of the time they're good. Um, but it's about having a system in place having a process that makes it easy for the clients to go through the process. My job is to make things easy for them because their problem is they need a piece of compelling content. Our solution is that we will create a piece of content that's going to deliver for them. And the result is the impact, the difference is that they're going to get more clients. They're going to get more leads, conversions, et cetera. And so whether it's a video project or it's an AM project, and I think any business needs to be very clear about how things go I take a lot of time at the front end explaining the process so that there are no surprises, you know, and I would say we can change something, but once it's approved, if we go backwards, it may incur some cost. And so again, mm. you're talking about being genuine and transparent. I think it's really important not to have anything hidden behind anywhere. And so it's really mm. clear uh, uh, about how you uh, approach things. And it's been very successful. People, people, I think, appreciate how, how we go through the process. Giving And one thing that I wanted to share, because I think it was interesting, is, you know, there are some businesses like, you should do this, you should do that. And I think there's a difference between that approach and still using your expertise to help people along. So when people are looking at, okay, what voiceover should I have? You know, and then I'm like, well, here are some selections. And, and then we go back, well, from my perspective, I don't think it's wrong to give some guidance you know, if you're looking for one that's a little more friendly, I think this one does that. If you're looking for one with more energy, I think this one does it. And so for them to get an idea of, oh, yeah, I really want to have it be a little more, you know, authoritative kind of, you know, this is, this is going to help you. And so it's about fi- finding that balance. And in the end, I think the best working relationships are what I would call collaborations. So it's not me telling them what to do. It's not them telling me what to do. It's about us working together to get the best product we can. Mm, absolutely. And I love it. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Last question because we we like getting short on time, but I absolutely want to ask that since like it's the topic in the past couple of months. Uh, artificial intelligence, especially we're talking about storytelling, and there's been like I'm sure you've seen like gazillion examples of of how you can you know get Chat GPT to write anything uh, on any topic with prompts, etc. How do you feel it's affecting or will affect what you do? My my feeling about it uh, is hot, hot topic. <laughs> You know, ChatGBT is going to um, replace all of us, all copywriters and content creators in general. And I think that is not true. I think like any advance in technology, and AI is no exception, that it will help some people. It's a tool. It's mm. a tool that will help. And so there's one thing that a lot of things that AI doesn't always get right is tone. And, you know, so there are certain human elements about your story that you're telling. It'll get it there, but it won't always get it right. I mean, one of the things they're talking about when you review some of these tools is they'll just 
that you can't rely on it. You can't rely on, you know, it's like doing research. You know, Google can tell you anything, right? But you can go find something, oh, well, it's on the internet. It must be true. And it may not be true. And so mm -hmm. I think it's about having the human elements as part of the process is never going to go away. It's mm -hmm. just not, you, you need, you need to, um, it, it's going to help the process and it may be good for brainstorming. It may be good for that first draft we kind of talked about. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, we talked about the fact that you might get some writing, but it may get you a moderately okay draft version of something. But I don't think it's going to get you to that final version mm -hmm. because it, it doesn't it doesn't understand all the components of all the things that are important um, mm -hmm. as much as we try. And, and I've I've played with it a tiny bit and it's impressive. It is. Mm -hmm. But I think people need to not freak out and get <laughs> scared about mm -hmm. it and realize, like, how can you best use this tool? I teach mm -hmm. social media marketing. And one of the things is, is like, oh, social media marketing didn't mean that okay well now anyone can do social media anyone can do social media can everyone do social media marketing well so mm -hmm. everyone can use ai but can you use it well and so Absolutely. i'm not worried i'm not worried about robots taking over um <laughs> i look at it um, as another trend another tool another technology to help us do our job even better absolutely that, that, I that's, absolutely that's my perspective on it yeah yeah, no, definitely. I had a chat recently about that with, uh, with another guest, and, and that's definitely where I am as well. And we've been using it as well. And it just sort of can help do research quicker, do some yeah. suggest some ideas. So it, in, in a way, you still have to do your job well. You still have to have a human doing it, taking it. But it can help with productivity and speed some things up. And, and again, like you said, you have to always check. We had it. We had a funny thing where... Um, it was we were using it for some research, one of the girls on the team, and I'm reading the thing, like the final result, and there's like a quote from Brad Pitt about whatever. I'm like, did Brad Pitt really say that? And then I checked and it, it didn't. He didn't, obviously. No. So it's just like it threw that in there. I was like, how did you even come up with that? <laughs> I, I don't think there's any fear that the next New York Times bestseller is going to be written by Chad. Oh, Pitt. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, then, then again, then again, there, there are some bestsellers that you're like, what? You know, people read all kind of stuff. So, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. <that's, laughs> I, let me let me rephrase that. I don't think the next literary masterpiece is going to come from AI. <laughs> no offense, New York. I, I'm I'm yeah. waiting to be proven wrong. So, um, <laughs> and even if that happens, someone had to be behind it, asking the right question. Yeah, yeah, you can. Ask, you got to ask the right question for it to then generate the right answers. Mm. And so there's an art to that. So it's it's mm. not simply like, oh, how do you do this? It's about how do you do this with this in mind and with that in mind. And, and so someone has to be understanding the complexities of what you're trying to get at in order to ask the right questions. And that's true of marketing and business in general. Sometimes it's not about providing answers, it's about providing the right question. Mm. Absolutely. That's a, yeah, that's a good way to end. Let's, let's end on that. Thank you for, for making the time. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I'm sure there's a lot of valuable information for our Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you for joining us in this episode of Smart Branding Podcast. Feel free to visit smartbranding.com for more information and reach out if you have any suggestions, questions, ideas, or just want to learn more about how a good domain name strategy can help you build a strong and successful brand. See you next time.